going to talk about some DQA technology options, so devices and uh, common tools that we use in the clinic, how we commission those devices and ensure that they are accurately measuring uh, our treatment machine output, the analysis methods that are commonly used for patient-specific QA, and also some considerations in terms of acceptance, commissioning, and treatment planning system. And then we'll conclude with some summer and resources. I believe these, these slides will be shared with everybody after the talk. And I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sonia Didrich, who, who has prepared the majority of these slides and has helped in discussion and preparation of the material. And a major disclaimer for this talk in particular, because we will be talking about QA devices, there will be a lot of vendor names that we will be throwing around. These do not constitute an endorsement of these vendors. They are simply some common tools that are used, but the concepts and the, the application and function of those tools are what it is, the is the focus of this primary, uh, of this talk. Okay, so IMRT, things that we need to consider. When we're looking at a plan, usually as a physicist and we're reviewing a, a chart and checking it, it's very important to start with organ contour in its entirety. A common miscontouring of an organ is, for example, a spinal cord that might be missing a contour on a particular CT slice. And that's an important note to, to make because spinal cord dose constraints are common point doses, such as Dmax that we're considered about, that we're worried, that we're worried about. And those values change as the contours are changed. So when you're looking at an IMRT plan, it's always important to consider the entirety plan before even jumping into IMRT components. And that goes into our particular margins being applied and dose gradients. Because the dose is going to be so conformal, all of these aspects are important. The uniformity in the target, is it acceptable? You're looking at hotspots and if the coverage is being satisfied. In addition to that, normal tissue sparing, even if there isn't a dose constraint, is still an important consideration. And those are usually called dose fingers or things that might be spilling into the normal tissue, the certain, certain dose lines, isodose lines, very important to consider. And inhomogeneity corrections are being properly applied by the treatment planning system. It's important to compare if a 3D plan is applicable for a particular case and if IMRT is needed entirely. And then beam orientations are, are also very important to consider. So these are aspects of planning and IMRT plans that are important because when we're looking at our treatment planning system, we have a theoretical dose, a, a predicted dose, a calculated dose as, as shown here on the left. And this dose is often used as uh, a close uh, representation of what is actually delivered. But the daily QA and patient-specific QA considerations of the machine as shown here on the right are what help us ensure that the delivered dose and the predicted dose match. So this is why it's important. And in the past, when IMRT was first being introduced, some accidents have occurred and they've been documented, such as a patient's death from overdosing, severe complications, and even things such as treatment deviations Major or, ma major or minor also have to be reported and have occurred in the past. And it's important to consider these for IMRT because we are using typically high MUs since we're modulating our beam. And an example of what, did, what occurred in 2005 was a plan which was intended to be with MLCs was delivered in an open field treatment without the MLCs in place. And because of such the high MUs that was planned, that was a very large overdose. So it's important to make sure that our MLC positions are being accurately positioned by the machine for each plan. And as we know, each plan is unique in IMRT and conformal, which, which is why often we QA 
individual plans, but there, there's a lot of work that has gone into if queuing every IMRT plan is essential or just queuing particular ones that are known to be challenging. And we'll get into that a little bit. So I can take a quick pause here since this is the end of the introduction. If anybody has any questions before we continue, feel free to raise your hand. And if not, we'll, we'll go on to the next section and we'll have more time for questions. In the, in the next section, we'll be talking a little bit about the devices that we use, typical ones, film, ion chamber, detector arrays, log file analysis, and EPID or portal dosimetry. So film. Film is very useful and still used in clinics quite frequently, in particular for challenging cases when MRT fails with, with other devices. Here lists here listed on the left side are sorry, there's a little bit of echo from my end. Are are steps that you would take to prepare a plan for IMRTQA with film. Typically, we have a phantom or solid water, as shown here on the right, which you would CT scan and import into your treatment planning system. And this is very common with all IMRTQA plans that we use a phantom to test our and measure dose. So these steps apply to all devices. And what we do is we transfer the beams from our patient CT to the CT scan of our phantom. And then we have a predicted dose on our phantom CT scan, which we can deliver and we can measure. So it's very common to use an ion chamber and a film setup, which allows for absolute dose measurement, as well as high spatial resolution measurement as well. So it, it's very common to have a combination of, yeah, of, of film and, and an ion chamber, as is shown here. Now, film analysis often is done in a 2D plane. So it's a planar dose measurement, and it's a high resolution measurement, which is often limited in, res in spatial resolution by your film scanner settings. Typical 300 dots per inch is, is used and it's, it's adequately very high resolution in terms of a measured dose. There is a task group report in, by, by the American Associations of Physicists and Medicine, task group 235, which gives recommendations on using GAF chromic film due to their convenience and low cost. It's important to rate films by the batch that they're bought in and with the scanner that is used for IMRTQA. Film calibration is uh, can be tricky and there, there's, so there are a lot of references that describe how to film, such as making sure that the right color channels are consistently used with the calibration data as well as the treatment plan delivery. Now these comparisons are done in how's how's my uh, how's my connection on your end? Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah it's breaking up a little bit but I, I can catch I think everything so it's not not too bad. Okay. Um, okay. Since we did take a break, I'll yeah. just throw out this question from the chat. Sully Osman Idris asked about, is there a limit or recommendation for accepting a high MU to dose ratio? Yeah, that's a great question. A typical, the higher the MU to dose ratio, it's, it is likely that the plan will not pass QA if it's highly modulated, which is what that means. If you're delivering, for example, a hundred or a thousand MU for a 200 centigrade fraction. So a factor of five between MU to dose. So the MU to dose ratio would be five. That is, I would say a plan that's just what I use as a, and this depends on the case and the target, but a, a ratio of five, I, I commonly use as a plan that is being pushed to its limit and is, is reaching an MU to dose ratio. That is, that is, that is, 
that it's kind of reaching its limit. Now, I, I wouldn't say that of a point of, of an, an ambulant dose ratio of six to 10, uh, we should not use at all. I would just flag that as a case that is more concerning and might fail to do it. Now, anything over a ratio of 10, I would say is concern and worth looking into in terms of the treatment planning system and usually is an indication that something was not set correctly. For example, that would occur if you used a flattening filter-free beam for a large target and applied a homogeneity penalty in the optimization. So if you try and make a large field very flat with a flattening filter-free beam, the only way to do that is by highly modulating that beam. And it would result in, uh, in very high MU to dose ratios and QA to fail. That's an example of a very high MU yeah. to dose ratio. <clears throat> So there's another question. You want to say if we deliver two gray 1200 MU, we have to replan. Again, I would say I would look at that plan and consider why it's so high. It, usually 1200 MU, 1200 MU for a two gray dose means that the plan is highly modulated. So there's going to be very small control points that are, are, being, are being used there. So why are those control points so small? And typically a machine can, will not be able to, to achieve that, which is why the measured dose will not match the planned dose. So again, I don't want to give any hard constraints of what you should replan for, but I think anything over a factor of 10 is highly suspicious. Those are, that's a very good question. And just in the interest of time, I'll move on to ion chambers. So as I mentioned, film and ion chambers are commonly used when you're trying to be very careful with IMRTQA because of the absolute dose that you get with an ion chamber. However, it is for only a single point. And when you combine that with film and the high spatial resolution, that's very useful. Now, a challenge with an ion chamber is the sensitive volume. And if you're trying to measure a smaller volume or dose in a smaller volume than your ion chamber volume or factors of your ion chamber volume, then that could be challenging. So you always want to make sure that the area where you're placing your ion chamber in the dose is homogeneous and also large enough to encompass the entire volume of the ion chamber while allowing enough space for particle to charge particle equilibrium as well. So I would say that's a limitation of, of, of ion chambers, but still commonly used and are, are ground truth absolute dose measurement. Now, as we get into more sophisticated devices, one is map check, which is commonly used by Sun Nuclear. And this is a 2D, and I labeled it as low resolution just to differentiate it from film. Here for a map check, and there are other vendors that provide diode detector arrays such as this. The important thing is that it has a spacing of seven millimeters between diodes, fairly high resolution, but not as high resolution as, as film. And you want to make sure that you're aware of that seven millimeter spacing when you're comparing planned and delivered dose. Now, almost all software packages with these devices perform some type of interpolation between these diodes. So you may be able to look at the software package and see dose between like in one millimeter spacings, but depending on the interpolation that's being applied, it should be interpreted with a lot of caution. These devices also provide the software, the raw values of the diodes. So you can look at the actual uninterpolated values, which might be useful if you're trying to make a very accurate measurement. But typically these measured doses have some interpolation that's being applied. 
Now, this is with, with diodes. Another detector that this should say low resolution is the matrix detector, which is ion chambers instead of diodes in there. And it has a similar resolution as with diodes and active area, and the same considerations are made. However, these are ion chambers, so you have the advantage of less dependencies than there are with diodes, which is, which is good. And you're also making absolute dose measurements as well. The, here's an example of, I think this is a map check comparison between a planned dose and a measured dose. And what is commonly used in the analysis is a gamma index. And uh, here is also a, a profile. So you will get into gamma a little bit, but for the settings of a 3% dose difference with two millimeters and a 10% threshold for this plan, for this plan, 96.5% of the points passed. A common threshold for gamma is 90% pass rate. So if 90% of the points pass, then we consider that plan to pass. However, just because gamma has a high passing rate doesn't always mean that the plan is, is a good plan and, and, and should be delivered. All of the other checks also have to be made, which is why IMRTQA is only one component of a good plan check, but it is, it is an important one. And, and that's why we're talking about it. A similar 2D planar array is, or a cylindrical one is arc check. So like a map check, instead of one plane, an arc check has diodes in a cylindrical form. And this is a little bit more useful because if we're applying a VMAT technique, as the gantry rotates around the arc check phantom, the cylindrical geometry is maintained, and then we can sort of flatten out that measurement, which looks something like this. So this is a typical analysis of a 2D arc check dose flattened out. And typically you would also use gamma to make a comparison here as well. There are, other, there are other detectors like Delta IV that now instead of using a single plane, they have diodes in two planes. And these diodes are five to 10 millimeters. So again, with diodes and these arrays, you're kind of getting somewhere between five to 10 millimeters of resolution. And you can even you know, use 10 millimeters as, as an upper limit if you, yeah. And like I measured, and like I mentioned, there's always some interpolation that's going on, which we should be aware of, but the Delta four does provide measurements in two planes, which is again, useful for an IMRT step and shoot, a VMAT plan. These detectors are built particularly for that geometry, which has a moving gantry as opposed to a static field. When you have a map check, you would typically not rotate the gantry. So if you have a VMAT plan, you disable in the treatment planning system gantry rotation, and the whole plan with the MLCs moving is delivered in an AP orientation. Unfortunately, you know, that has a disadvantage of not be a true representation of what the treatment will be delivered as, but with our mechanical checks on our LINAC and our output checks, is, is that's how we guarantee that it is accurate enough. Go back here for a second. One, there is a task group that's being developed looking, so task group 213 is looking to provide an overview of all of the IMRT QA detectors, and there are a lot of them, and this table is very useful because it gives some of their specifications which you would need, which you might need when you're entering them in the treatment planning system and when you're making measurements. So things like buildup density, backscatter, these are things that you, you want to know of your detector when you're entering them in the treatment planning system. I guess this is it's not a detector, but an analysis method. So log file QA, a lot of the vendors vary in Electa as the machine is finishing treatment. A log file is written, which contains all of the MLC positions at each control point. It can change the gantry angle, the collimator angle, and the leaf positions, like I mentioned. And these are actual measurements based off of the sensors in the machine. So these log files contain values, not from the treatment plan, but from 
the treatment delivery. And this allows us to compare if the correct gantry angle was being set, the collimator angle, and the leaf position. However, and, and all of these things, as we know, influence the fluence maps compared to the treatment planning system. However, there isn't any actual dose being delivered so or, or measured. There, there is dose being delivered, but it's not being measured by a detector. So you're relying on the vendor readings from their sensors in the machine to evaluate if the treatment was accurately delivered. There are, there's been a lot of work that has gone into looking at log file QA, and there are some open source tools at analyzing the log file data. There are Python codes, MATLAB code, which are again, open source and quite useful for research purposes, but also in the clinic when you're analyzing your data, which is, which is important. And here's an example of, of, of what that might look like, but there are numerous, uh, numerous formats that exist. Here's another log file QA, a commercial system. So this is, I believe from, is this, it might be Mobius or it might be some, something else, but there's their Varian and Electa uh, software packages that will analyze the log files from the machine. And lastly, just to mention this is since we do have most Linux have an EPID portal, what is commonly done is you can measure the output fluence with the portal and then reconstruct some type of dose or compare the delivered dose based off of the EPIC. So this is for IMRTQA. So you can do this without the patient there with just the phantom in place. Now, again, analyzing the EPID images, there are packages available that will allow you to do this and they, they are very useful and they do provide, I guess, again, a 3D representation of the delivered dose which is dose that has been reconstructed in the CT scan. Although a word of caution that these reconstructions make a lot of assumptions and it is quite difficult to reconstruct dose accurately in a patient's anatomy based off of portal dosimetry measurements. Okay. So although it is useful to see dose volume histograms with IMRTQA, they, they should be interpreted with, with caution. Why don't we pause here? I'm sure there are a lot of questions about these devices. Yeah, that was really great. And there are quite a number of questions. So I'll just go through them starting, you know, kind of from the beginning with film. Can you give a comment? Sabrina was asking about film orientation and, and the dependency of that and, and the experience with it. Yeah, certainly. As far as I know, there is no dependency in terms of film orientation. Film is great for that reason. I've personally measured percent depth doses with the film of parallel with the beam delivery, which is which is done. You know, it's a time-consuming way of measuring a PDD, but it, it, it has been done. And you can you can say you, you would have to sandwich the film with solid water, and then you can do that. But what's commonly done is you're kind of looking of a transverse plane. So Commonly, a film is placed flat and then dose is delivered. But if you did want, for a particular reason, a plane on a 45 degree, you can still somehow sandwich the film between solid water and plastic and place it in different orientations and measure dose along that plane. Now, a lot of the challenges when you're interpreting the analysis, which we'll get into, is you know, matching the plane that you're measuring with the predicted plane and being able to accurately do that requires accurate setup and, you know, just care careful measurements with, with, with film. So typically a simple setup, a flat film in the transverse is, is adequate as long as you're looking at a plane, which is of interest. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. I think you're right. In the actual delivery, the orientation of the film can be whatever you want, but it, it's it's important in my experience to have your calibration readout and your film readout to be in the same orientation. I think that film has gotten better, and some of the film is not as dependent on that. Um, but but to have the best reading, you should have them in the same orientation, the same side up, the same 90 degree rotation when you're doing the actual film scanning as the calibration. 
Great point. And just quickly, I don't know if you have any resources or maybe this isn't mm-hmm. something to address right now and can be addressed after in communication with RCC, but any sources in getting films for departments that maybe can't find them? That's a great point. The Yes. So the APM has, they do have some resources that they're gathering for this particular reason. I believe there's a global committee in the APM, and I can share that with RCC, which we we can share with everybody in attendance. But that's a great question. And there are other organizations that RCC is working with, such as Radiating Hope, and they're primarily focused on getting phantoms, films, and other equipment to other countries. Okay, great. Thanks. We'll move on now to ionization chambers. And I guess... What is the, I think you kind of went over the evaluation criteria for a plan with an ionization chamber and the importance of choosing high dose gradient and low dose gradient regions in that placement? Yeah, most IMRT QA plans that are, uh, the uh, IMRT QA plans are with ion chambers, you're using a micro chamber. So like the smaller, not your typical semi-flex or farmer chamber that you might use for annual or commissioning. And that's because usually you want your ion chamber to be inside your target to, so you want to measure, you want to make sure that you're delivering the dose to the target that you've planned. And often IMRT targets are small. Sometimes there are multi-targets and complex. So being able to shift your phantom in a way that is, that is, that your ion chamber is placed in in, in the right areas is really important, but you you want to take all of this into consideration because you can't account for everything, especially if if the target is it has a hot spot in it. So, for example, if you know that your the point that you're measuring is near a steep dose gradient, then maybe you might allow for a three percent to five percent difference because you know that there is some sort of averaging that's happening. But if you're in a, a, a uniform dose region that's fairly large and encompasses the entire chamber, there's no reason why you would ex- you should accept a, a 3% difference. There might be a setup issue. It's something that you would consider more informed. So it's important to be aware of them, but they can't always be avoided. Other times you're worried about an, uh, an organ at risk that's very close to a target, and you might want to measure the dose to that organ at risk to ensure that you're sculpting the dose adequately near there. Again, there's going to be a sharp dose gradient there. So depending on how close you are to that dose gradient, you might accept some sl- some larger deviations in the measured dose. Great. Thank you. That's a wonderfully put. For VMAT IMRTQA, we'll move on to that next. You talked a little bit about delivering from gantry zero. I will just mention, I think there's also like the Octavius where you can rotate the array with the gantry for delivery, but that maybe isn't accessible to everybody. But yeah. one of the questions is which kind of tests should you do? Or is there anything additional you need to make sure about your machine if you're going to be delivering your VMAT QA from gantry zero? Is there any concerns with that? Yeah, you know, this is where understanding your monthly QA and your daily QA is really important. You know, sometimes you know from daily QA that, hey, when there's, when the gantries at a particular angle, some of the tests are just not as accurate. And you talk to your engineers and you try and understand that sometimes it can be corrected, sometimes it cannot. So it's just important to be aware of machine limitations. Again, the, the monthly annual daily QA is what you would use for that. Besides that, you I guess you always aim to QA with the same setup as treatment. And then you, so if you can do that, then you should, you should aim to do that. If you cannot, uh, that's where these other tools become more useful like the, the planar, the planar detectors. I like to mention there are other devices that you can attach to the gantry for that particular reason so that you can still include the gantry rotation. And we know that that gantry rotation, if you're really pushing your, your, your treatment plan to deliver a very complex plan, that'll come into it. The gantry speed, the sag of the machine, those are all things that could result in a measured dose that doesn't match a predicted dose. And I will 
actually touch on that a little bit in the next slide. So let me let me do that now because that's a really good point. And it's important to do that with commissioning. So great questions. And I really appreciate Tim at the point about being able to commissioning or calibrating your machine or your device and then using it in the same way as you calibrated it. And that's, and, and that's important. So you want to do an initial device calibration for all of your devices. For film, you're getting your calibration curves and you're establishing your setup field sizes, these, all of that energy dose rate, you want to make sure that you have all of that documented because a particular plan will not always match those settings. And if there are differences in dose rate, for example, you, you those should be noted. Every other device, um, arc check or map check, they come with a software package and they have various steps for doing the calibration. This is a very important part. And whenever there are discrepancies between measure, large discrepancies between measured and predicted, it's not uncommon for it to be a calibration issue. Either the wrong calibration file was being applied or a calibration file is outdated and needs to be updated. So these are, these are all very common things. Again, you wanna use your annual QA as benchmarks. Things like large fields, you want to check small fields, you want to check as well. And it's important to note that although we want to find plans that pass and we want to understand why these plans pass, annual QA is a great time to have plans that you know will fail. You can make some really, really complex plans on phantoms and they are not deliverable. So you can, you can push the treatment planning system to, to, to predict a dose that's not deliverable. And it's a good test during annual QA to say that, okay, I know this plan will fail and I know why. For example, really small fields being overly modulated, the wrong energy being used for a particular plan. That will, that will reassure you that, um, that, 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 that you know kind of what's happening. If, a, if all plans are always passing, it's really hard to understand what's going on and where the thresholds are and where the limits of the machine are. So I think how I've been taught and what I've been told is annual QA, it's great to have some challenging plans that you can, that you can further analyze. And uh, here, here's a list of certain tests that you can perform on, on, on these uh, machines, on these devices. Of course, physical integrity, if there is some sort of damage on the device, let's say somebody has dropped one of the devices over use, that, that should be recalibrated, investigated. It's really important. Something that is common with diodes is response uniformity, which is listed here as, as on the fifth. There are a lot of differences in, between diodes. And when you're doing the, when you're doing calibration and commissioning, many corrections are being applied differently spatially, like it's spatially dependent corrections are being applied, uh, which may change. And that's why the calibration is important to note the date and, and, and look at. With TG213 uh, also gives recommendations in terms of an Excel sheet of how you would look at all of these tests. Now, that's why TG213 is going to be an important task group because it's going, it, it does detail the uniformity, linearity, mm -hmm. things that should be commissioned and checked with these devices. And what I want to point out is that uh, both ion chamber arrays and diode arrays, we use them because they're, they're useful tools. They provide us spatial in, information quickly. Whereas with film, you have to scan it, you have to analyze it. These tools uh, are made to, to be all inclusive. But I want to point out a couple of differences that are noted in TG213. And that is that these response uniformity and linearity with diode arrays can go as high as a couple of percent in the discrepancies over time. So if those accumulate and compound, you can very quickly see that for particular plans that maybe are large or highly modulated in, in, in dose, if there is a uniformity or linearity correction that is misapplied, then there's going to be a big impact in that. TG213 also does a failure mode analysis, which follows TG100 in terms of identifying modes of failure that are very common. So that includes calibration changes, shifts in the detector, which, which can occur, 
leakage, linearity, and, and there are various reasons for that. So things to things to consider. When without going into all of this uh, in great detail, we want to be able to, to do these commissioning and, and acceptance. We want to do the commissioning and acceptance tests where you look at all of all of these things that are being listed here, like uniformity, leakage, linearity. And, and that's important to do periodically. Let's let's pause there before I get into the analysis. I'll just make a quick comment. We will see if we can send out a copy of TG213 to the participants. I'll let Ben and Caroline know and see if they can just send it out after the presentation. Besides that, I don't think we have any questions on that specific part, so we can go ahead. And we'll save the other questions from the previous sections for the end. That sounds great. So DQA analysis, this is where gamma index becomes important in understanding it. You're comparing a measured dose and a predicted dose, and you're looking at the discrepancies between them. The initial thought might be that, hey, I could just subtract the two, the two doses that I have and look at the dose differences that way. And that sounds like a great idea if there was a perfect match in setup spatially between the predicted and measured doses. However, there are always some uncertainties in our setup. So those dose planes will not always match. And that's where gamma index is important because it incorporates both spatial and dose differences. A couple of, a couple of points about how you would make this measurement. And this is where we were talking about having a fixed gantry angle or having a moving, a moving gantry angle. In, in TG218, a couple of terms that are used are perpendicular field by field, which is our fixed gantry, and you would deliver individual beams on the device without the gantry moving, and then analyze those fields individually. Uh, the disadvantage is that you never are comparing with a patient an individual field. You're always looking at the total field. So individual beams, if there is, let's say, a 3% difference in an individual beam, and that might be concerning for, for a physicist, the, a physician is quickly going to ask, well, what's the impact on the total plan? So that's where the perpendicular composite is important because then you're looking on the sum of the beams and that is usually what's more important. Although individual beam analysis is also useful for identifying issues. And then a true composite here is when you are delivering the dose in the same way as treatment. Again, TG213 goes into this into, into great detail and talks about, about these different configurations. There is no one right way to do this. It depends on the tools that you have in your clinic, the time that you have to QA, and the complexity of the plans. Yeah, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Let's, so let's skip this slide here. This was the analysis criteria of gamma index and a universal action limits. Dose threshold of 10% and the pass rate of 3 3% with 2 millimeters or 3% with 3 millimeters is what's commonly used for IMRT. And you want a gamma passing rate of greater than 90%. Ideally, if it's a low 90, you might be suspicious. And gamma rates are usually higher than, than 90%. But, but 90 is, is a threshold that is commonly used in clinics. And, and this is where, I guess, also DVH-based criteria can be important as well because clinically dose volume histograms is what we use when we're specifying dose tolerances. So, so here's a couple of examples of cases when you would, when you would want to look at, at DVH tolerances. There have been many papers that have looked at gamma passing rate as, as the criteria threshold, and there has, we've, there's been identification of shortcomings with gamma passing rate. For example, there have been very high gammas, but still plans that are not delivering predicted dose, which is important to be aware of. And an important thing here is the spatial resolution between the predicted dose and the spatial resolution between the measured dose. Very common dose grid resolutions for IMRT are three millimeters cubed. And like I mentioned earlier with arc check matrix or, 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 or map check, we don't have that level of resolution. So those interpolation is necessary and that can cause some misleading results. Just, just that's something to be aware of and be careful of, especially near high dose gradient regions. So 
Let's see. There's, there's an interesting paper by UC San Diego, a physicist that, that looked at EPID-based patient QA and reasons for failure and when they were caught using a TG100 failure mode analysis. And here you can see that majority of plans that, that were caught and failed QA were caught at first fraction. And things like prescription errors were identified as being high mode of analysis, failure modes. And these are things that physicists might miss because we're so focused on making sure that we're measuring physical dose accurately. And usually a therapist will not miss if there's a prescription error or if there's any sort of error like that. So, or incorrect contouring. So this was an interesting paper and the, the reason for failure mode analysis is, is, is described here. And very quickly, because I want to leave some time for questions and discussion as a commissioning tool, you know, IMRTQA is, is, is really important. And this goes into when you're commissioning, when you're doing an end to end test and you're looking at your, your measured dose, it's important to have plans that are tricky plans that are moderate and plans that are simple. And you expect that their gamma passing rate or dose accuracy changes depending on those plan complexities. So for example, you can have a plan that you make on a phantom with multiple targets and, and you have dose goals as listed here and you can measure and you can measure the dose in these plans. And that's an important consideration for a multi-target plan that you would want to have in commissioning and, and QA. Another common one is now if you're getting to more of the nearby organs at risk is a mock prostate plan as the one shown here, where you have a prostate target, you have a rectum and you have a bladder and typical dose goals are listed. And this would be an example where you might want to measure not only dose inside the target, but maybe also dose in one of the OARs to make sure that you are adequately sculpting out dose there. Typical one as well as this, this C-shape head and neck where you have a complex PTV with a spinal cord, parotid glands on both sides, and commonly a head and neck plan can be highly modulated because you are trying to sculpt the dose around these organs at risk that are nearby. And here is an example of maybe a spine case where the target uh, encompasses and surrounds most of the spine. And in addition to, in addition to the target, you're also trying to spare, you're also trying to reduce the dose at the center of the cord. So this is, this is a plan that is usually being pushed very hard and you can trick, you, you can really push the optimizer uh, to, to plan a beautiful plan, but the machine might not be able to deliver it. And this is a good example of, of a way of being able to get a hard to deliver plan as part of commissioning. These are really important things. And just the last note is a note about the dynamic leaf gap that we have a setting for in our treatment planning system. It's very common that if this leaf gap setting, the transmission through is not, or, and the gap itself is not set correctly, that uh, you might still get high gamma passing rates, but there are large dose differences. And you always wanna check your B model and, and then perform additional tests such as film and ion chamber in addition to the device that is commonly used for QA. So I'll, I'll just make a couple of summary notes and then we can have a couple of questions. Pass rates, again, uh, are statistics and they do impact individual patients. And we, we uncover a lot of issues, uh, but there are also some hidden ones. So it's not a universal number that, that can be used to identify all issues. A qualified medical physicist has to develop good IMRTQA practices and take your time to identify why a plan is being delivered the way that it is. And again, this is where I would emphasize to have those test cases that you know are easy or hard, and you can understand why those pass or fail before you go to a patient plan, which is unique and difficult to interrogate in detail as, as a phantom plan. So, and lastly, I think it's important to always reach out to physicists in your clinic if a plan fails, but also outside your clinic. Either, I, think, I think almost every clinic has a unique set of, of plans that are, that are hard to deliver 
and and it always helps us discuss with colleagues as we are doing now what what those challenges are. Thank you.